Before we jump into this week's episode, we have a quintuple shout out. How Woo! many is that? Five. 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 Yes. We have five new patron subscribers, which means we literally doubled. We did. We doubled. But we tell doubled. them what that actually means. We have 10 now. We're 10. We have a total of 10. <laughs> we have 10 pat patrons and we're excited. We have right. Hunter, Haley, times two, two Haley's, two Janet, and Tiffany. Welcome aboard. Um, we've got our first patron only episode coming out. Yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes. So look forward to It's a behind to that. the scenes one. It is. If you'd like to become a patron, um, the link is in the description of the video or you can find it on nursesuncorked.com. I'm Nurse Jessica Seitz, along with Nurse Erica. We're Nurses Uncorked, the podcast that takes nursing facts with nursing comedy and makes a little cocktail out of it. Hey guys, welcome back to Nurses Uncorked. It's um, Nurse Erica alongside me. I'm Nurse Jessica Seitz, and we are here for part two of our interview with um, the ANA. We are uh, currently interviewing Dr. Debbie Hatmaker, which is the chief nursing officer um, of the ANA. And we had so much information that we had to make this a two-parter and so many questions. Um, so we're going to get right into, right, Erica, into part part yeah, two. Yeah, so if you let's... haven't heard part one, you might want to go back and give that one a listen. But yeah, let's get into it. Uh, I'm curious, just you personally, not necessarily the ANA, but what was your initial reaction when learning about Operation Nightingale? Uh, I was pretty amazed, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> Me too. As I, as, I, <laughs> as I said, I worked in nursing education for 16 years. It was a long time. And I know the systems in place and, uh, you know, all the, you know, all the hoops that schools of nursing have to jump through the regulations, their accreditation. So I was pretty amazed, especially, you know, the scale that it was. So uh, I, I think some of us were just kind of scratching our heads trying to, to say, and then, and then certainly wanting to support. There's a statement certainly coming out from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing that we are endorsing to really focus on how to prevent anything like this going forward, um, to really look at issues of fraud and try to be aware of them. But uh, yeah, it was. The, the sheer scope of it is yeah. Yeah. absolutely appalling that they were able to yeah. pull it off in these numbers and yeah. for so long. It yeah. just defies explanation, you know. Um, what, what would you say to all of the hospitals, uh, and organizations that have come forward claiming to have not had a single incident of patient harm resulting from having essentially a fake nurse care for patients? Yeah, well, I, I will tell you, and I don't want to speak authoritatively because some of this information has come to, to us secondhand. We weren't. Mm -hmm primary, you know, in, in the investigation or anything, but, you know, uh, many of the things that we understood was um, some of these individuals had some type of practice experience. They might have been licensed practical nurses or had some background. Uh, they weren't just kind of someone they pulled in off the street and, you know, made a nurse. Um, and you know, so I think that, um, you know, that that was, uh, you know, certainly a factor. Um, and and then I would I would question about, um, you know, how exactly were they doing their practice and, and how did they, you know, were they cautious in what they were doing? Or, again, I do think some of them were relying on other experience uh, to that extent. And, you know, sometimes harm happens, and but it's not as obvious. So mm -hmm. right. at, at least True. what we know, there True, hasn't yeah. been uh, reported. So we'll, we'll certainly, you know, hope there hasn't been. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you touched on magnet status earlier. I wanted to circle back to that a little bit. Uh, many nurses feel that magnet status, the credential, does not translate into real impact at the bedside. 
Health systems with magnet or pathway to excellence designation have made national news for retaliatory workplace practices, and yet they still maintain their credential. Many frontline nurses feel the credential is essentially bought and paid for. How does that make the ANA feel? And how are these systems able to maintain their status? Well, um, I do have confidence in the process. I, I realize that there are issues that bubble up. I've heard from some of those nurses because I've been to the Magnet Conference now for um, many years, or I run into nurses out, uh, or we get individual comments sometimes into us about nurses who um, are who have concerns uh, who may be working in those facilities. And I can say to you, every one of those comments that come into us, uh, any written complaint, are investigated. Um, I, I do think uh, there's no organization that's perfect, um, but they have to uphold the standards. They have to document the standards. They have to go through a rigorous site visit. They have to go through public comment. And they have to continue to demonstrate that they live it even between their designation period. Um, again, we know that there are issues that bubble up. And of course, when some of those very high visibility issues bubble up, um, they have requirements to inform us and then demonstrate that they are working through the issues or that they, um, you know, what the circumstances are around some of those difficult issues where they may have not upheld the standards or where the complaint is that they have not. Um, so I, I remain and have a great deal of confidence in the magnet standard in the programs um, and in those designations. I, I recognize, I hear them. I've talked to nurses who feel that uh, either in their own unit or maybe it goes more broadly than that if they believe it's entire hospital. Maybe they don't believe their facility is living up to the standard. But we take those very seriously uh, and we do uh, look into those most directly. Um, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but what solutions is the ANA Enterprise providing on the issue of, like specifically for, for burnout and mental health issues of nurses? Because that obviously is, is huge right now. Nursing burnout is probably more than it's ever been. Um, what Can you touch a little bit more on what specific kinds of things are, are being done? Right, right. Well, our Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation program um, does have uh, a, a comprehensive definition of health, nurses' health, and certainly mental health is one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of resources and um, things to take advantage of in the Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation program. You can do that individually as nurses. Uh, some facilities also participate collectively as an organization. We can give them results, uh, anonymous results um, on, on their participation from their staff in, in that work. So we continue to kind of uh, engage through that way. And then, as I said, the, the, our foundation has started a large pilot with United Health uh, around the, stir, the stress and burnout prevention pilot. Um, we have a lot of excitement around that um, uh, program because it is not just an individual response. I think that certainly has been some of the complaints nurses had, and rightly so, that it was left to them to have to deal with. Uh, but it really is a, a systematic approach with the stress and burnout prevention to look at what can happen within the organization to try and prevent burnout and to decrease stress. Right. Um, uh, so a lot of works, and I do think it's going to take systematic uh, uh, efforts and programs. It's certainly not fair uh, to put on any single individual that uh, it's up to you to deal with and therefore go use an app or meditate or whatever uh, in order to right. deal with this, but, but to really look at what are the unit and the, uh, and the system uh, approaches that we have to take in order to safeguard a nurse's health. I'm glad to hear you say that, that it's more about preventing it rather than yeah. once it's there, then 
how do we deal with it? You know, because if, if we could just omit the getting there part of it, that would, that would definitely, uh, help things. And I, I do think a lot of, as far as mental health, I think nurses, a lot of times are scared to report their mental health status for fear of, again, yes. uh, retaliation or, or getting nursing in, retaliation. in trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's a, yeah. that's a, that's another hard one. That's another hard aspect of it too. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Where we've had a fair amount of discussion, certainly work with indiv- some individual boards of nursing, continue to do that to remove any stigma around uh, uh, mental health issues and to make sure that any questions about reporting are um, appropriate and mm-hmm. not, uh, you know, not discriminatory in nature. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in 2021, the ANA began to examine its own history in relation to racism in nursing. The outcome was the adoption of the racial reckoning statement that served as an apology to nurses of color that have been harmed by ANA decisions or omissions that may have contributed to systemic racism in the profession. The statement included an acknowledgement that from 1916 to 1964, the ANA purposely and systematically excluded black nurses. Uh, how is the ANA preparing nurses to address racism in healthcare, embrace diversity, and advance health equity? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. We're we're very invested in this work, and in fact, uh, this is another example of a body of work where we know we can't do it alone. Uh, you make a reference to our racial reckoning statement, and we certainly believe before we kicked off any collaborative work to deal with racism in nursing, we had to address our own issues, our own historical issues, yes. and certainly speak to those and to seek, um, for, you know, uh, to apologize and to seek, um, you know, reconciliation with the organizations where we thought, uh, where we believe we had harm. So um, that statement, you know, was unanimously approved at our annual meeting. Uh, we then followed that with a number of individual conversations with many of the ethnic and minority nursing associations who sometimes those conversations were difficult and, and that as they should be. Right. Uh, and we continue to have uh, ongoing discussions with those organizations as we work collaboratively to move toward what do we want our relationship to be going forward? And how are we going to best work together to make that happen in order to drive inclusion and to drive um, be- much better diversity in the profession so that we look like the population we serve? At the same time, we were kind of taking our own position, making our own statement about, about our racial history and about racial reconciliation. Uh, we uh, formed with uh, uh, three other organizations uh, to form the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. And uh, that includes the National Black Nurses Association, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, and the National Coalition of Ethnic and Minority Nurses Association to really get at how do we want to do this work together moving forward to remove racism or certainly to address racism in nursing. Their first, um, their first year, they were very focused, and we have that available on the website to anyone who wants to look, a foundational report where we focused on what are the issues? What are the issues in education, in research, in policy, and in practice? Uh, and so we um, did listening tours uh, and meetings uh, with uh, nurses so that they could talk about their own experience, whether that was historical or even current, so current issues they were dealing with, uh, and wrote the foundational report uh, with the commission and the co-chairs to really say, this is the issue. These are the problems. These are issues we have to address. Since the foundational report, there's been kind of uh, the next phase of the commission, which has really been focused on what are the actions we need to be taking in order 
to uh, really move on these issues that were identified. Um, we're on our fourth series of what we call Project ECHO education series. And, and when uh, this is a model in which it's not just someone standing up and teaching and lecturing about, it is about the dialogue that occurs from the group. Uh, we had over 1,600 participants in the last uh, series, uh, and we had great feedback that they believed it gave them the opportunity to talk about the problems and really began to identify the way to address those problems, either for them personally or in their own organizations and institutions. So we continue to be very committed to this work as we move forward, both on the racial reconciliation aspect, as well as the commission to address racism in nursing. Um, we, we see this as a multi-year um, issue. It's not gonna just be solved quickly right. and then yeah. all of a sudden <laughs> we shut it down. Um, but we're very committed and to collaborate uh, with our uh, sister organizations to really try to address this difficult issue. There seems to be a lot of nurses that still remain completely unaware uh, that the ANA issued this apology. Um, perhaps the timing, because it was released in 2021, where, of course, we had uh, bigger fish to fry, right? Uh, yeah, we may yeah. not have been paying attention to everything else. Um, what are you doing to get the message out there? No, that's a great question. We we do continue to speak to the issue uh, around what the foundation, what we found in the foundation report, and then to talk very specifically about the ongoing work. And I, I'll give you a perfect example of where uh, it became clear to us that we still have to keep talking about the foundational work that was done, particularly for individuals who are new coming into the profession. As you might imagine, um, every year we have the opportunity, often it's our president who goes to speak to the National Student Nurses Association uh, at their meetings. And uh, just last year, not this year, but last year, uh, there was a major focus and session on the National Commission's work and the foundational report. And uh, there were so many people that had come up to us and said, I've never heard this before. I haven't heard this address. Right. So not only do we have to continue to talk about it there, we have to talk to their faculty and make sure yes. that, that they that's are a great introducing point. this. Yeah, they are introducing that into their courses, even if they can't go deep. You know, we all know that nursing education covers a lot of ground. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. If they can't go deep, we want everyone to leave their education program and say, oh, yes, this work is happening. Maybe I need to go look at that a little closer. Um, so we're we're working really hard to make sure that with um, that we take every advantage of, of opportunities to continue to tell people about this work and to tell them about the the steps we're taking, hopefully, to move forward and, and to move some progress. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is something that's been going on for several years, but. How do you feel about the push for um, the minimum degree to be a BSN for nurses? Because I know that there's obviously been a lot of nurses that are frustrated about it. And, you know, uh, the whole thing with having to go back to school when they're already stressed, burnout. How, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, you may know this is old history. You know, back, back decades ago, ANA did have an older position that was subsequently rescinded. Uh, that did support BSN as entry. Uh, we moved away. Our current position is certainly we 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 support uh, various levels of entry. Um, we work with organizations who um, who come in at the associate degree level, the baccalaureate degree, graduate level, uh, and and I think we would continue to be very committed to doing that. Uh, and. Even in our certification space, our specialty certifications uh, that we have in the American Nurses Credentialing Center does allow for various levels of education. So there isn't a specific requirement. I think for many of us, it's less uh, about the way you enter nursing, but more of a focus on lifelong learning. 
Uh, now, some people choose to do that through professional education, you know, a degree, uh, uh, but others choose to do that differently. They may choose to do it through a certification in their specialty or, you know, uh, changes in their job or their role uh, in order to continue to learn and, and I think benefit from that as they kind of hopefully see a, a long career ahead. Do you happen to remember when approximately the ANA rescinded their position on the BSN requirement? Let's take a moment to hear from one of our sponsors. You know what I was thinking of the other day? How hard it used to be to look for nursing jobs. Remember you had to wait for the Sunday classifieds? I never did that. How old are you, Erica? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm old too. That really dates us. Yes. It and does. then as things progress, I remember getting on like the job boards at work and trying to occasionally sneak around while you're at work and try to oh, yeah. see what positions are available. But I've gotten past that. I have a new, I use an app now because it's so much easier. Me too. Which one do you use? Uh, I use Vivian Health. I love Vivian That's Health. That's the one I use. Get out love of Vivian. here. Yeah. I love yeah. Vivian. I feel like it's like online shopping. It's like a one-stop <laughs> shop that you can just look for jobs and it's kind of like putting them in your basket and applying. It's an amazing job marketplace. I love it. I love the the pay transparency. They put it all out there so you know ahead of time what each employer pays. It's great. Yeah, that's true. There's no like hiding it. Um, and I think they've got like, it's not just full-time positions, right? There's all sorts yeah, of stuff. It's like per diem, part-time, even travel nurse positions, everything on there. And it's not just nurses, it's allied health. It's everyone. That's true. It, it really, it makes it so easy. Um, since we love it, I think you guys will love it. So check out Vivian Health. The link is in the description of this, this podcast. You won't regret it. It's been a while since I, it's been a while That's since okay. I looked that up. I, I, I believe the statement, the, the original goal was, was uh, set in the sixties. Mm -hmm. so that's how long ago yeah. it was. Wow. Um, and, and we moved, we moved away from that um, clearly because I, I think, you know, at, at, uh, for, for those individuals who were here, I, I was not here uh, when that happened. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, a particular philosophy about nursing education. Um, you know, at that point in time, we still had a number of nursing programs in the country that used more of an apprentice model. Mm -hmm. that were yeah, there's still diploma programs based. out there. Yes, there are still, there are still some out there. Um, and, and I think, you know, maybe that was more of the effort to move away from an apprenticeship model. Um, but, but certainly, I think by then, the associate degree programs had, had you know, proven kind of their position uh, in, in the educational landscape. Uh, and, and I think it was certainly seen after a period of time. Okay. That's good. I know a, a lot of nurses that have been on the ground for a long time that, you know, a, a lot, I saw a lot of nurses that opted to retire early. We lost a lot of good nurses. Well, because, especially uh, when they're not having tuition reimbursement or they are nearing the end of their career right. or, you know, right. you could understand in those situations why someone would not want to go back to school. But uh, I wanted to circle back to violence against nurses that uh, you touched on earlier, because violence against nurses and healthcare workers is something I am extremely passionate about. Nurses, as you know, are being assaulted and frankly killed at work seemingly on a daily basis these days, while healthcare organizations do little to nothing to ensure our safety. What, if anything, is the ANA doing to address that? Well, I, I think we're working on multiple fun, fronts. You know, one of them I've, I mentioned previously, which is the area of advocacy around either regulatory or legislative changes. So certainly um, there have been um, some state levels that have passed legislation around. Uh, some of them might have been that, uh, you know, violence against a nurse or a healthcare provider is seen as a felony and, and really driving some severe penalties in the effort to really hope that that might be preventative. I'm not sure it always is when we think about someone often in the heat of a moment of committing an act of violence. Um, I, you know, we also support a, a lot of 
um, efforts um, in our standards around workplace violence, around working toward um, a no tolerance environment in which uh, certainly we work with uh, employers to propose. And then additionally in the regulatory space, uh, that is the area we're pushing right now, particularly with the challenges in Congress, uh, to really push the, um, the OSHA to really go ahead and release standards that are way overdue uh, around the issue of workplace violence that would hold employers accountable and require them to put certain measures in place. Uh, yes. Not too long ago, I, I had the opportunity to hear a panel on workplace violence, and one of the panel members was um, the lead of security um, at a large health system, uh, and he talked a good deal about all the measures they have in place and, and how it's a part of their training and education for all of their staff as far as how to de-escalate issues around that could potentially ramp up to violence, around having access to security on a very quick basis to move things around. So uh, what we're hopeful is we would have OSHA standards in a regulatory space that would then require systems to really look at how they address those and move toward a best practice, which is what I heard this particular security professional describing in his facility. Sounds like a lot Thank of you. push to have employers be held accountable in uh, on yeah, many levels. They need to be. Levels. Yeah. But sadly, you know, I think that that's how nurses feel is that um, their organizations are more concerned about money and the bottom dollar versus what's really going on, you know? So I'm, I'm glad to hear that repetitively being said about employers being held up to certain standards. So that's mm -hmm. encouraging. Uh, Kentucky recently became the first and only state to decriminalize medical errors. In the wake of the Redonda Vought case, there continues to be uh, an alarming push for criminal prosecution of nurses around the country. Will the ANA encourage other states to follow in Kentucky's footsteps? And it's a two-part question. And what is the ANA doing to promote just culture? Yeah, uh, great question. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, we actually provided a letter um, at I am. John DeVault's trial uh, in, in which we spoke to the issues around systemic errors and the decriminalization aspect. We had a great deal of communication with her and with her attorney uh, as we looked at the issues surrounding that case. Uh, there was a good deal of discussion across our state um, after that particular case, and, and as it turns out, Kentucky is the first one who's moved forward. We congratulated them. I just spoke to their executive director the other day to congratulate them. And um, right now on our listserv with our state leaders, there is a fair amount of discussion going on about um, that particular that particular bill, uh, who else is ready to move forward, uh, what kind of support we can give them at the uh, at the federal level, or we can give them uh, as they attempt to move things state uh, statewide forward. So uh, we would like to see uh, continuing efforts around to decriminalize uh, uh, medical errors. And, um, you know, we've certainly been on record of that. Um, the challenge is always, you know, in passing legislation. But, but again, I think there is a, a strong effort to speak on behalf of nurses and not hold them accountable for what our system error. That's good to hear. Um, I, I would like to say... Uh... I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the ANA did not release a statement on uh, the Redonda Vought case until after her conviction. It was prior to the sentencing, but after she had already been found guilty. Uh, we would have liked to have seen a much earlier response from the ANA. So let me give you a little bit of circumstances around this, because this happens Please. to us somewhat regularly, and it happened in this particular case. 
uh, when, when issues like this come to our attention, uh, we often have outreach with the individual or their representative or their attorney, and we let them tell us when what would be most helpful, particularly when it's a legal issue. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of ongoing discussion throughout the trial with the Tennessee Nurses Association, with uh, Ravonda, uh, Redonda Vault's attorney about what would be most helpful. Uh, and in fact, we even had a discussion about would we be willing to go and testify? Uh, so, uh, you know, our ability to speak or to enter a case, uh, whether it's with a statement, sometimes it may even be with financial support, Depends. I will tell you, historically, it's happened, not often, but at times, um, is that we have to take our lead from the individual and from, from their own uh, legal uh, representative to make sure we're doing what's best for them as well. I understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, this goes back to not just a and a board members, but also managerial uh, people in positions of upper management. I feel like nurses feel like the ANA and and like I'm saying nurse managers are kind are far removed from the on the ground what it's like in the day to day being a nurse. And I, I will say I'm speaking for many, many nurses when I say that, that they feel like you I don't want to say you, but they feel like their leaders are not understanding because they're not doing that groundwork. What what would you say to nurses that feel that feel that way, that feel like our leadership is far removed from what it's really like? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's not the first time, certainly, I've heard that. And, and we certainly talk to nurses regularly who ask us that question. I, I would say if you came to our annual meeting, you would see a broad mix of nurses who are there as representatives. Some of them are in management positions. Others are in are in direct care, staff nurse, public health, education. So I, I believe we have a wide representation. It, it's not exclusively, certainly in direct care, but uh, we we really do um, believe that we attempt to hear from the breadth of nurses and. On occasion, on particular issues, we might go out and seek input from direct care nurses because maybe we think we don't have sufficient information or we don't want nurse managers to speak on behalf of staff nurses. We want to hear from them directly. Uh, and I will tell you, even when we look at the, the attendees of our uh, Magnet and Pathway Conference, our annual conference that last year we hit a a major goal of, of 13,000 attendees, about half of them are in direct care. Uh, so um, I, I can understand that thinking, particularly yeah. if you look at our leadership or you think, oh, this person's in management or they haven't, they haven't done direct care in a number of years. Uh, I, I, I like to think we work hard at making sure we give opportunities and, and seek input from those who are doing direct care. Is, I'm curious, is there a minimum education requirement to be uh, a board member of the ANA? There is not. And in fact, one, there are nine board positions on the ANA board. One of them is exclusively a director at large staff nurse position. They must meet the definition of a staff nurse. The other is a director at large new graduate. They had to have they have to have been within five years of, of graduating good. their undergraduate program. It could be associate or baccalaureate, but um, their initial licensure program. So uh, we certainly tap into that through that board leadership as well. It's good to have a okay. wide, wide range. Yeah. How would you respond to the nursing community saying that uh, it appears to them that the American Hospital Association heavily influences the ANA and operates in a quid pro quo type relationship? I would be surprised by that. 
because we don't have any organizational ties to the American Hospital Association. In fact, I would tell you that uh, in any discussions with nurse exec groups or various other groups, they sometimes push back differently against that. Uh, there are times through the pandemic, the pandemic is probably the most recent example, where ANA, the American Medical Association, and the American Hospital Association did some joint statements. We had to be fully aligned on those statements. Sometimes it was about access to PPE. Uh, there were some other times during that period that ANA was prepared to make a statement, and, and uh, they weren't prepared to sign on with us, so we went at went alone into that space, whether uh, we might be pushing on the policy side. So um, I, I think the comment that we're too aligned, I would ask the individual, can you give me some specific examples? Because uh, organization to organization, while we certainly collaborate with the nurse exec groups, we have these examples of where we had, at least during the pandemic, some joint statements. Uh, we don't do our work kind of together. Certainly, we don't we don't take our direction uh, from there. Does the and I don't know, but uh, does the hospital association donate financially to ANA causes? No, they do not. No. Okay. We have individual, you know, systems. I, you know, I uh, who might uh, engage, uh, you know. Mint there are hospitals who are customers of ANCC, um, right? Or, um, but no, we don't have certainly not from AJ. No. Okay. If you had to say right now, what does the ANA see as? Let's say their top three priorities. If you or or just your top couple priorities, what what do you think the major push is right now? For nurses? Well, I think we've talked about um, several of them. Certainly, our, our work in staffing continues, and that, that pot, you know, the work environment issues, whether it's about workplace violence or tools for wellness, well being, um, really moving uh, in a space to really drive those issues around work environment. Uh, and uh, um, also, these issues around racism and nursing continues to be um, some very large areas. Um, again, new to our strategic plan this year is that whole body of work around value of nursing, really looking at uh, reimbursement, what does mm -hmm. nursing can, uh, contribute economically to the system. And uh, somewhat new to us uh, in our strategic plan is are issues around uh, virtual nursing. We know that there are hospitals that are adding virtual nursing, but certainly yes. as we look at, at what those hospitals are doing, they're doing them very differently. As we talk mm -hmm. to individual hospitals, they're doing them quite differently. So we're really um, starting a, an issues panel to look at what are some standards and guidelines around virtual nursing and uh, really making sure we've been directed by our, our, uh, our membership assembly, our annual meeting, that uh, the use of virtual nursing should not replace uh, nurses as we um, as we provide uh, direct care. Uh, and then kind of related, but not the same, uh, we're beginning to look at um, uh, augmented intelligence, AI, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, um, and how that is starting to creep into clinical decision making, uh, various areas uh, within healthcare. Um, because it certainly seems like it's it's uh, moving quickly uh, in all aspects of our yes. lives, not just healthcare, and really thinking about how might this impact healthcare and how might it impact nursing, the, uh, the profession the care that we provide. You already yeah. you already answered one of our questions. Oh, I know. <laughs> Skipped ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there's no official position statement yet. I assume from the ANA when it comes to virtual nursing and or AI. Okay, so we don't have a discrete position on virtual nursing. We we will we will come out of our panel uh, with that. Uh, uh, on AI, we have a we have a statement from our Center for Ethics and Human Rights uh, specific to AI that is uh, broadly written around 
the responsibilities of the nurse, the ethical responsibilities of the nurse to provide care, um, and, and uh, that aspect. So we have a relatively, um, you know, within the last uh, little bit position um, on the ethical view. And of course, uh, ANA is the steward of the code of ethics for nurses. We're, yes. Uh, we, we're right in the midst of a major revision this year in the code. I'm sure artificial intelligence will come forward even more strongly in this next mm -hmm. revision. Uh, and so by next year, we should be launching the next version of the code of ethics. Okay. Yeah, definitely some hot button issues that uh, are not going away that are going to need to be addressed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Iowa recently passed legislation capping travel nurse pay. Does the ANA have a position on capping nurses' pay? Uh, no, we did not take a position around around capping pay. We we recognize uh, and believe certainly, um, you know, the marketplace would take care of that if if uh, if if travel nurses continue to be. Uh, desired and uh, their ability to work and and set their um, set their reimbursement uh, and employers desire to do that. Uh, so we did not uh, take any particular position about capping or withholding that. Um, again, it, it feels like it got uh, pretty dramatic, certainly during the the worst of the pandemic. Yes. So it, maybe it's leveling out now a bit as as things you know, began to get uh, a little more stable, but, you know, I didn't take a position. Okay. It's something that uh, I think travel nurses and nurses everywhere are uh, concerned about and watching, you know, uh, there's really no other industry that comes to mind that would have the audacity to suggest capping someone's income potential, you know? Uh, and so the fact that they are, uh, seemingly already doing it to nurses is con concerning, alarming, you know. Frustrating. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly, uh, at, at least what we heard that there were, you know, legislators that were very much focused on, you know, hospitals and their, I guess, bottom line, and they found this as a way to deal with it. I think for most of us, we felt like the marketplace would take care of it. And if if employers were doing what they needed to do with the, uh, their work environments and with their hiring of nurses, shouldn't be shouldn't be a challenge. So, yeah. As the largest professional association for nurses, how is the ANA Enterprise working to improve the work environment for nurses, um, specifically around the staffing crisis? I, I uh, well, again, I think we're using multiple means by which we uh, uh, do this. Uh, again, working, I think, it, with our states, many of which are choosing to have legislative uh, opportunities, Oregon being that example. Um, other states are looking at, uh, you know, regulatory or legislative means. To, some of them may continue to try staffing committees or or uh, other aspects of that, um, and and again, I think certainly at the at the national level, um, our efforts around advocacy, as well as um, even our standards in the Magnet and Pathway Program, speak to not 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 uh, required staffing ratios, but to really meet ratios in which uh, to meet those patient care ratios that meet with providing a positive practice environment or providing nursing excellence and positive outcomes. So they have to speak and address uh, the way they uh, deal with their staffing in those standards. Right now, if you had a family member ask you, with the way nursing is right now, and they said, should I become a nurse? Should I go into nursing? What, what is your honest, honest answer? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to say to you that um, I have always loved this profession. I've been doing it for 45 years, a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've loved the fact that I've gone in and out of a variety of specialties. You mentioned a, a few of them earlier. Um, and I, I have to believe that uh, 
some of the challenges we have now, we will we will continue to look for and find solutions. I hope but so. But I, I think I would be honest about the challenges that we have right now. And for someone who that's not what they're looking for, uh, or maybe they have a more rosy idea about what it would be like, I, I would want them to be clear about about what practice is like now. And then if they still wanted to do it, I would say, go, go do it and find you a wonderful mentor. And, uh, you know, if, if one employment place or one specialty practice doesn't work for you, there's lots more out there. So don't feel kind of constricted or hemmed in. Um, use the opportunities throughout your career to find kind of where your next best uh, practice site is. You took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly yeah. how I would, how I answer <laughs> yeah. it pretty much. Uh, you, you have the stage, so to speak, right now, Dr. Hatmaker. What would you like to say to the nursing community, to the nursing profession right now that maybe you have not been able to touch on? Well, I, I think what I would what I would say um, is, and I, I used to say this to my students. I always taught the course I most loved to teach when I was in nursing school was to junior nursing students um, in their kind of first foundational issues course. And I, I started the course. That was where you learned about theorists. You learned mm-hmm. about. Uh, the history of nursing, you learned about your first kind of view of what it meant to be politically active and, you know, various other things, all that foundational. And I, I joking, only half jokingly would say to them, um, this is your most important course in your nursing program. And, you know, they, none of them believed me. <laughs> of course, they were, they were learning all the important things in skill lab about taking vital signs and starting IVs and, and pathophysiology. And, and, um, Interestingly enough, uh, I think when they mastered those, uh, quite often, sometimes a year or two out of school, I would hear from some of them who would circle back and think about, oh, those foundational issues of ethics and advocacy and, you know, uh, practice standards are important because they continue to carry on with me, whether I'm in a position where I start IVs or I don't start IVs. Um, So... I I like to think that, you know, getting grounded um, in in those aspects of your career are important. And um, that's why I say to individuals, I used to also say to them, I'm, I'm going to advocate always for you to belong to your professional association. I want you to belong to A&A as mm-hmm. well as maybe your specialty organization, but belong to a specialty nursing, uh, to a nursing organization. I agree. Because that should be what feeds your soul. Yeah. You know, we, we love doing patient care or we love speaking on behalf of the profession or doing advocacy. But I think engagement with our professional peers um, kind of feeds our soul and reminds us why we're, why we're here, why we're in the profession. I know it's easy for me to say uh, it has been a love of mine as that's why I ended up kind of on the staff side of a professional association. Uh, but I did this for many years, even when I was doing direct care. And I often said to people, um, I know that when you get very busy with your family and your jobs, you're going to think less of it. You may even stop paying mm-hmm. your dues or maybe you're only paying your dues, but you're not engaged. That's fine too. I raised three children. I, I know how demanding it could be, mm-hmm. but just know that engagement with your, with your uh, fellow nurses, with your, with your peers is so important. And so find ways to do that to nourish your soul. Uh, this is kind of an off topic question, but it's just something that I like to ask nurses when I meet with them. Who is your favorite nursing theorist? Oh, I, I wouldn't even be able to name. I, I wouldn't be able to even name one. Spend you're taking yeah. me. You'd be well, taking me way I, back. I, I will say to you, I, I you know, in, in in my master's program, I certainly did the nursing theorist course and went through a lot of them. Um, you know, I, I often, especially these days, I often resonate with who's not maybe a classical nursing theorist, but I. 
I uh, resonate with Patricia Benner's uh, novice to expert model. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because I feel like I've lived that model uh, mm -hmm. uh, either throughout my career or even when I shifted from one type of nursing to another, you feel like, well, I was an ex, I was closer to being an expert over here, but now I'm back in a new setting, new experiences. I'm almost back to the novice level. And, and I think for me, um, just that model has always, you know, kind of resonated as I think about it or, or apply it. I used it uh, recently in an advocacy class that I taught about political advocacy. And uh, I had them rate themselves on the novice to expert uh, mm -hmm. scale in the, in the area of advocacy. So that was kind of interesting, too. Yeah. Um that was going to be my last question, but I actually just thought of one that I wanted to uh, throw in here, if you don't mind. Uh, what is the ANA's position on nursing strikes? I know in the past, uh, the organization was against strikes. Has that changed? Well, I wouldn't say we were against strikes. We actually believe nurses should advocate uh, as, as through through what measure works for them. So mm -hmm. we certainly have, um, we have affiliates, state affiliates that are collective bargaining, that do collective bargaining on behalf of nurses, and we have state affiliates who do not do collective bargaining. Uh, and we support the nurses' right to choose what activities, what workplace activities works for them. Now, would we hope and desire and support that they don't have to get to the position of have to strike in order to make changes. Yes, and we work very hard to give tools and and other measures, education, other resources to try and improve the work environment. But but uh, I think we're realistic that sometimes it, it it is a measure of last resort, and nurses have the right to choose collective action if they, if they if they believe that it's necessary. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Jessica, did you have any other questions for Dr. Hatmaker? No, no. I just would like, like I was saying earlier with, um, you know, social media and, and nurses hearing more from the ANA, we would love to extend any time, like I was saying earlier, yeah. if you or, or anyone else from the ANA would like to, even if it's once every couple of months, come on the podcast and um, answer questions that maybe nurses are, are, are thinking or new things that are dialogue. brewing. Yeah. I think it's very, very important because I, I think nurses want to be heard, you know, right. foremost, they, they just, they want yeah. to be listened to and they want to know that, that, that people are hearing them, you know, that our, that our leaders are listening. So um, no, no more questions. Just, I'm, I'm glad that um, you, you guys reached out to us and I'm, very thankful for that. I think it's the first, it's a big olive branch and it's a good, it's a good thing to do. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of trauma and a lot of stuff that's happened to yeah. nurses over the last <laughs> few years and it needs repairing, you know? Yeah. So. Well, thank you for this opportunity. We, 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 we are more than willing to engage. We have some, um, real subject matter experts, both on staff and our members and, and elected leaders. So I, th I think there certainly could be future opportunities to talk about some, some subjects great. of interest, but, but we always look forward uh, to talking to nurses, to talking to, uh, you know, members of the public about what nurses do. And so um, thank you for this opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you really so much for, for meeting with us and taking time out of your day to meet with us. This is an important conversation.